Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. I'm Lucas Perry. Today's episode is with Rohan Shaw. He is a longtime friend of this podcast, and this is the fourth time we've had him on. Every time we talk to him, he gives us excellent overviews of the current thinking in technical AI alignment research. And in this episode, he does just that. Our interviews with Rohan go all the way back to December of 2018. They're super informative, and I highly recommend checking them out if you'd like to do a deeper dive into technical AI alignment research. You can find links to those in the description of this episode. Rohan is a research scientist on the technical AGI safety team at DeepMind. He completed his PhD at the Center for Human Compatible AI at UC Berkeley, where he worked on building AI systems that can learn to assist a human user, even if they don't initially understand what the human user wants. Rohan is particularly interested in big picture questions about artificial intelligence. What techniques will we use to build human level AI systems? How will their deployment affect the world? And what can we do to make sure this deployment goes better? He writes up summaries and thoughts about recent work tackling these questions in the alignment newsletter, which I highly recommend following if you're interested in AI alignment research. Rohan is also involved in effective altruism and out of concern for animal welfare is almost vegan. And with that, I'm happy to present this interview with Rohan Shaw. Welcome back, Rohan. Uh, this is your your third time on the podcast, I believe. We have this this series of podcasts that we've been doing where you help give us a year in review of of AI alignment and everything that's been up. You're someone I view as very core and crucial to the AI alignment community, and I'm always happy and excited to be getting your your perspective on what's changing and what's going on. Um, so to start off, I just want to, you know, hit you with a simple, not simple question of what is AI alignment? Oh boy. Excellent. I, I love that we're starting there. Um, yeah. So different people will, will tell you different things for this, as I'm sure you know. The framing I prefer to use is that, um, there is a particular class of failures that we might be we, we can think about with AI, where the AI is doing something that its designers did not want it to do, um, and it's like it's uh, and specifically it's competently achieving some sort of goal or objective or or some some sort of competent behavior um, that isn't the one that was intended by the designers. Uh, this. Uh, so, for example, if you try to build an AI system that is, I don't know, supposed to help you schedule calendar events, and then it like also starts sending emails on your behalf to people, um, which maybe you didn't want it to do, that would count as an alignment failure. Um, whereas if, you know, a terrorist somehow makes an AI system that, that, can, that goes and detonates a bomb, in some big city that is not an alignment failure. It is obviously bad, um, but it, the AI system did what it was, what its designer intended for it to do. So it doesn't count under, as an alignment failure on my definition of the problem. Other people will see AI alignment as synonymous with AI safety. Um, for those people uh, that, you know, terrorists using a bomb might count as an alignment uh, failure, but at least when I'm using the term, I, I usually mean, you know, the AI system is either uh, is doing something that wasn't what its uh, designers intended for it to do. There's a little bit of a subtlety there where you can think of either intent alignment, where you like try to figure out what the AI system is trying to do. Um, and then if it is trying to do something that isn't what the designers wanted, that's an intent alignment failure. Or you can say, all right, screw all of this, you know, notion of trying. We don't know what trying is. How can we look at a piece of code and say whether or not it's trying to do something? Uh, and instead, we can talk about impact alignment, uh, which is just like the actual behavior that the AI system does 
is that what the designers intended or not? Uh, so if the AI makes a catastrophic mistake where the AI like, you know, thinks that this is the big red button for happiness and sunshine, but actually it's the big red button that launches nukes, uh, that is a that is a failure on impact alignment, but isn't a failure on intent alignment. Uh, assuming the AI like legitimately believed that the, the button was um, happy, happiness and sunshine, I think I said. So it seems like you could have one or more or less of these in a system at the same time. So which do you, which are you excited about? Which do you think are more important than the others? In terms of what do we actually care about, which is how I usually interpret in, important, uh, the answer is just like pretty clearly impact alignment. Like the thing we care about is like, did the AI system do what we want or not? Uh, I nevertheless tend to think in terms of intent alignment um, because it seems like it is decomposing the problem into a natural notion of like what the AI system is trying to do and whether the AI system is capable enough to do it. And I think that is like actually a like natural division. Like you can, you can in fact talk about these things separately. Um, and because of that, it like makes sense to have research organized around those two things uh, separately. But that is a claim I am making about the best way to decompose the problem that we actually care about. Um, and that is why I focus on intent alignment. But like, what do we actually care about? Impact alignment, totally. How would you say that your perspective of this problem has changed over the past year? I've spent a lot of time thinking about the problem of, of inner alignment. Um, so this was this shut up to I mean, people have been talking about it for a while, but it shut up to prominence in, I want to say, 2019 with the publication of the Mesa Optimizers paper. And I was not a huge fan of that framing, um, but I do think that the problem that it's it's showing is like actually an important one. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about that. Can you explain what inner alignment is and how it fits yeah. into the definitions of uh, what AI alignment is? Yeah. So AI alignment, the way I've de described it so far, is just sort of like pretty, it, it's just talking about properties of an AI system. It doesn't really talk about how that AI system was built. Uh, but if you actually want to diagnose, at, like give reasons why problems might arise and then how to solve them, you probably want to talk about how the AI systems are built and why they're likely to cause such problems. Uh, inner alignment, I don't, I'm not sure if I like the, the, the name, but we'll go with it for now. Inner alignment is a problem that I claim happens for systems that learn. Um, and the problem is, um, maybe I should explain it with an example. Uh, you might have heard, seen this post from uh, Less Wrong about blegs and rubes. Uh, these bleg, blegs uh, are blue in color and tend to be egg-shaped uh, in, in all the cases you've seen so far. Rubes are, are red in color and are cube-shaped, at least in all the cases you've seen so far. And now suddenly you see a red egg-shaped thing. Is it a bleg or a rube? Uh, like in this case, it's pretty obvious that like you know there isn't a correct answer, um, and this same dynamic can arise in a learning system, um, where if it is you know learning how to behave in accordance with whatever we are training it to do, we're going to be training it on a particular set of situations, and if those situations change uh, in the future along some axis that the AI system didn't see during training it may generalize uh, badly. So a good example of this is um, came from the Objective Robustness and Deep Reinforcement Learning paper. They trained an agent on uh, the coin run environment from ProcGen. Uh, this, is an, this is basically a very simple platformer game where the agent just has to jump over enemies and, and obstacles to get to the end and collect the coin. And the coin is always at the far, far right end of the level. 
And so, you know, you train your AI system on, you know, a bunch of different kinds of levels, different obstacles, different enemies, they're placed in different ways, you have to jump in different ways, but the coin is always at the end on the right. Uh, and it turns out, if you then take your AI system and test it on a new level where the coin is placed somewhere else in the level, not all the way to the right, the agent just continues to, you know, jump over obstacles, enemies, and so on. Like, behaves very competently in the in the platforming game, but it just runs all the way to the right and then like stays at the right or jumps up and down as though hoping that there's a coin there. Um, and like, I would, it's behaving as if it has the objective of go as far to the right as possible, even though we trained it on the objective, um, get the coin, or at least that's what you know, we were thinking of as the objective. Uh, and, you know, this happened because we didn't show it any examples where the coin was anywhere other than the right side of the level. So the inner alignment problem is when you train a system on, you know, one set of inputs, it learns how to behave well on that set of inputs. But then when, it's be when you extrapolate it, its behavior to other inputs that you hadn't seen during training. Uh, it turns out to do something that's very capable, but not what you intended. Can you give an example of what this could look like in the real world rather than in like a, a training simulation in a virtual environment? Yeah. Um, one example I like uh, is, it's, it's, it'll take a bit of, bit of setup, but I think it should be fine. Um, you know, you could imagine that with, honestly, even today's technology, we might be able to train an AI system that can just schedule meetings for you. Like when someone emails you asking for a meeting, you're just like, here, calendar scheduling agent, please, you know, do whatever you need to do in order to get this meeting scheduled. I, I want to have it. You, you know, go, go schedule it. And then it, you know, goes and uh, emails the person who e emails back saying, you know, Rohan is free at such and such times. He like prefers uh, morning meetings or whatever. Uh, and then, if, you know, there's a back and forth between uh, and then the meeting gets scheduled. For concreteness, let's say that the way we do this is we take a pre-trained language model, like say GPT-3, um, and then we just have GPT-3 respond to emails. Um, and we you know, train it from human feedback. Well, we, we, we have some examples of like people scheduling emails. We do supervised fine tuning on GPT-3 to like get it started. And then we like fine tune uh, more from human feedback uh, in order to get it to be good at this task. And it, it all works great. Now let's say that in 2023, Gmail decides that, you know, Gmail also wants to be a chat app and so it adds emoji reactions to emails. Um, and everyone's like, oh my god, now there's so much, there's such a better, we can, we can schedule meetings so much better. Uh, we can just like, you know, say, here, here, uh, just send an email to all the people who are coming to the meeting and, you know, react with emojis uh, for each of the times that you're available. Uh, and, you know, everyone loves this. This is how people start scheduling meetings now. But it turns out that this AI system, when it's confronted with these emoji emoji polls, it like it knows, it in theory is capable or knows how to use the emoji polls. It like knows what's going on, but it was always trained to like schedule the meeting by email. So maybe it maybe it will have learned to like always schedule the meeting by email and not to take advantage of these uh, new features. So it might say something like. Hey, I don't, um, I don't really know how to use these newfangled emoji polls. Can we just schedule emails the normal way? Like, like in in our terms, this would be a flat out lie. But like from the AI's perspective, we might think of like the AI was just trained to to say whatever you know sequence of English words led to getting a meeting scheduled by email, and it predicts that sequence of words will work well. Would this actually happen? If I actually trained an agent this way, I don't know. Like, it's totally possible I would actually do the right thing. 
Uh, but I don't think we can really rule out the wrong thing either. It seems that also seems pretty plausible to me in this scenario. One important part of this that I think has come up in our previous conversations is that we don't know when there is always an inner misalignment between the system and the objective we would like for it to learn because part of maximizing the inner aligned objective could be giving the appearance of being aligned with the outer objective that we're interested in. Could you explain and unpack that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, in the AI safety community, we tend to think about ways that AIs could like actually lead to human extinction. And so, you know, the example that I gave does not in fact lead to human extinction. Uh, it is, you know, a mi mild annoyance at, at worst. Uh, the, the story that gets you to human extinction um, is one in which you have a very capable, super intelligent AI system. Uh, but nonetheless, there's like, you know, instead of learning the objective that we care, that we wanted, which might have been, I don't know, something like be a good personal assistant. I'm just giving that out as a concrete example. It, it could be other things as well. Instead of acting as though it were optimizing that objective, it ends up op optimizing some other objective. Um, and I don't really want to give an example here because the whole premise is that it could be a weird objective we don't really know. Could you expand that a little bit more, like how it would be a weird objective that we wouldn't really know? Okay, so let's take as a concrete example, it's make paper clips, which has nothing to do with being a personal assistant. Now, why is this at all plausible? The reason is that even if this super intelligent AI system had the objective make paper clips, during training, while we are in control, uh, it's going to realize that if it doesn't do the things that we want it to do, we're just going to turn it off. Uh, and as a result, it will be incentivized to do whatever we want until it can make sure that we can't turn it off. And then it goes and builds its paperclip empire. Um, and so when I say like it could be a weird objective, I mostly just mean that almost any objective is compatible with this sort of a story. Um, it does rely on Sorry, I'm also curious if you could explain how the like the inner state of the system becomes aligned to something that is not what we actually care about. I might go back to the coin run, coin run example where, you know, the agent could have learned to get the coin. That was a totally valid policy it could have learned. Uh, and this is an actual experiment that people have run. Um, so, th so this one is not hypothetical. Uh, it just didn't. It learned to go to the right. Why? I mean, I don't know. I wish I understood neural nets well enough to answer this question for you. I'm not really arguing for it's definitely going to like learn make paper clips. I'm just arguing for like there's this whole set of things it could learn, and we don't know which one it's going to learn, which seems kind of bad. Is it kind of like there's the thing we actually care about and then a lot of things that are like roughly correlated with it, which I think you've used the word, for example, before is like proxy objectives. Um, yeah. So that is definitely one way that it could happen where, you know, we ask it to make humans happy and it learns that smile when humans smile. Uh they, they are usually happy and then learns the proxy objective of make humans smile and then like, you know, goes and tapes everyone's faces uh, so that they are permanently smiling. Um, that's a way that things could happen. Um, but like, I think I don't even want to claim that that's what, like, maybe that's what happens. Maybe it just actually optimizes for human happiness. Maybe it learns to make paper clips for just some weird reason. I mean, not paper clips. Maybe it decides like this particular arrangement of atoms and this novel structure that we don't really have a word for is the thing that it wants for some reason. And all of these seem totally compatible with we trained it to be good, to have good behavior in the situations that we cared about uh, because it might just be deceiving us until um, it has enough power to unilaterally do what it wants without worrying about us stopping it. Um, 
I do think that there is some sense of like, no, paperclip maximization is too weird. If you trained it to make humans happy, it would not learn to, to maximize paperclips. There's just like no path by which like paperclips somehow become the one thing it cares about. I'm also sympathetic, sympathetic to like, maybe it just doesn't care about anything to the extent of like optimizing the entire universe to turn it into that sort of thing. Um, I am really just arguing for, we really don't know. <laughs> crazy shit could happen. I, I, I will bet on crazy, crazy shit is ha uh, will happen um, unless we like do a bunch of research and figure out how to make it so that crazy shit doesn't happen. Um, I just don't really know what the crazy shit will be. Do you think that that example of the like agent in that virtual environment, you, you see that as like a demonstration of the kinds of arbitrary goals that the agent could learn and that that space is really wide and deep. And so it could be arbitrarily weird and we have no idea what kind of goal it could end up learning and then deceive us. I think it is not that great evidence for that position, um, mostly because like, I think it's reasonably likely that if you told somebody the setup of what you were planning to do, if you told an ML researcher or an RL, maybe specifically a deep RL researcher, the setup of that experiment and asked them to predict what would have happened, I think they probably would have, um, especially if you told them, hey, do you think maybe it'll just like run to the right and jump up and down at the end? I think they'd be like, yeah, that seems likely, not just plausible, but actually likely. Um, that was definitely my reaction when uh, I was first told about this result. I was like, oh yeah, of course that will happen. Um, like in that case, I think we like just do know, know is a strong word. Re ML researchers have good enough intuitions about those situations, I think, that, that it was predictable in advance. Though I don't actually know of anyone who predicted it in advance. Um, so that one I don't think is all that supportive of it learns an arbitrary goal. Like we we had some like notion that neural nets care a lot more about like, you know, position and like simple functions of the action like always go right, rather than complex visual features like this, you know, yellow coin that you have to learn from pixels. Uh, that. I think people could have probably predicted that. So we touched on like on definitions of AI alignment and now we've been exploring your, you know, your, your interest in inner alignment or I think the jargon is, is Mesa optimizers. Um, they're, they are different things. They're different things. Could you yes. explain how inner alignment and Mesa optimizers are different? Yeah. So. I think I maybe have not been doing as much as I should have uh, is that is the like inner alignment is is the claim that like when the circumstances change, the agent generalizes catastrophically in some way. It like behaves as though it's optimizing some other objective than the one that we actually want. Uh, so it's it's much more of a claim about the behavior rather than like the internal workings of the AI system that cause that behavior. Mesa optimization, at least under the definition of the 2019 paper, is, uh, is talking uh, specifically about AI systems that are executing an explicit optimization algorithm. So like the forward pass of a neural net is itself an optimization algorithm. We're not talking about gradient descent here. And then the metric that is being used in that you know, within the neural network optimization algorithm is the inner objective, or sorry, the Mesa objective. Um, so it's making a claim about how the, how the AI system's cognition is structured, whereas inner alignment more broadly is just like the AI behaves in this like catastrophically generalizing way. Could you explain what outer alignment is? Sure. Inner alignment can be thought of as like, you know, suppose we got the training objective correctly. Correct. Suppose like, you know, the things that we're training the AI system to do on the situations that we're, that, that we give it as input, like we're actually training it to do the right thing. Then things can go wrong if it like behaves differently in some new situation that we hadn't trained it on. Outer alignment is basically when the, 
the word function that you specify for training the AI system is it's itself not what you actually wanted. Uh, so for example, maybe you want your AI to be helpful to you or to tell you true things, uh, but instead you have, you train your AI system to, you know, go find credible looking websites and tell you what the credible looking websites say. And it turns out that sometimes the credible looking websites don't actually tell you true things. In that case, you're going to get an AI that tells you what credible looking websites say, rather than an AI that tells you what things are true. And that's in some sense an outer alignment failure. You like, even the feedback you were giving the AI system was you know, pushing it away from telling you the truth and pushing it towards telling you what credible looking websites will say, which are correlated, of course, but they're not the same. In general, if you like give me an AI system with some misalignment and you ask me, was this a failure of outer alignment or inner alignment? Mostly I'm like, that's a somewhat confused question. But one way that you can, uh, you can make it not be confused is you can say, all right, let's look at the, um, let's look at the inputs on which it was trained. Now, if ever on an input on which we trained, we gave it some like clearly some wrong feedback where we were like the AI like you know lied to me and I gave it like plus a thousand reward, then you're like, okay, clearly that's outer alignment. We just gave it the wrong feedback in the first place. Supposing that didn't happen, then I think what you would want to ask is, okay, let me think about on the situation situations in which the AI does something bad, what would I have given counterfactually as a reward? And this requires you to have some notion of a counterfactual. Uh, when you write down a programmatic reward function, the counterfactual is a bit more obvious. It's like, you know, whatever that program would have output on that input. And so I think that's the usual setting in which outer alignment has been discussed, and it's it's pretty clear what it means there. But once you're like training from from human feedback, it's not so clear what it means. Like, what would the human uh, have given this feedback on the situation that they've never seen before? It's often pretty ambiguous. If you define such a counterfactual, then I think I'm like yes. Uh, if th then I think I'm like okay, you look at what what feedback you would have given on the counterfactual. If that feedback was you know good, uh, actually led to the behavior that you wanted, then it's an inner alignment failure. If that counterfactual feedback was bad, not what you would have wanted, then it's an outer alignment failure. If you were speaking to someone who was not familiar with AI alignment, for example, other people in the computer science community, but also policymakers or the general public, and you have all of these definitions of AI alignment that you've given, like intent alignment and impact alignment, and then we have the inner and outer alignment problems. Um, how would you capture the the core problem of AI alignment? And would you say that inner or outer alignment is a bigger part of the problem? I would probably focus on intent alignment for the reasons I have given before. Of it just seems like a more like I, I really do want to focus on the cases where I like I, I want to focus attention away from the cases where the AI is trying to do the right thing, but like makes a mistake, which would be a failure of impact alignment. Uh, but I like, I don't think that is the like biggest risk. I think an AI, an, a super intelligent AI system that is trying to do the right thing is like extremely unlikely to lead to catastrophic outcomes, though it's certainly not impossible. Or, or at least more unlikely to lead to catastrophic outcomes than like humans in the same position or something. So that would be my justification for impact alignment. I, uh, or for intent alignment, sorry. I'm not sure that I would even talk very much about inner and outer alignment. I think I would probably like just not focus on definitions and instead focus on examples. The core argument I would make would depend a lot on how AI systems are being built. Um, as I mentioned, inner alignment is a problem that, according to me, afflicts primarily learning systems. I don't think it really affects planning systems. What is the difference between a learning system and a planning system? 
um, a learning system, you like give it examples of how it should, of, of things it should do, how it should behave, and then like changes itself to like, to to do the, to do things more in that vein. A planning system takes a like formally represented objective, and then uh, searches over possible hypothetical sequences of actions it could take in order to achieve that objective. Um, and if you consider a system like that, it just you, you can try to make the inner alignment argument, and it just won't work. Uh, which is why I say that the inner alignment um, problem is primarily about learning systems. Going back to the previous question, uh, so the the things I would talk about depend a lot on what sorts of AI systems we're building. If it were a planning system. I would basically just talk about outer alignment, um, where I would be like, what if the formally representative, re represented objective is not the thing that we actually cared about, care about? It seems really hard to formally represent the objective that we want. Um, but if we're instead talking about like deep learning systems um, that are being trained from human feedback, then I think I would focus on two problems. One is cases where uh, the AI system knows something, but the human doesn't. And so the human gives bad feedback as a result. Uh, so for example, the AI system knows that COVID was uh, caused by a lab leak. It's just like got incontrovertible proof of this or something. Um, and then but you know we the we as humans are like no we uh, it, when it says COVID was caused by a lab leak, we're like we don't know that, and we say no bad, don't say that. Uh, and then when it says you know COVID is we it is uncertain whether COVID is res uh, the result of a lab leak or naturally um, or or if it just occurred via natural mutations. Uh, and then we're like yes, good, say more of that. And you're like you know your AI system learns, okay, I shouldn't report true things. I should report, you know, things that humans believe or something. Uh, and so like, that's, that's one way in which you get AI systems that don't do what you want. Um, and then the other way would be more of this inner alignment style story, uh, where I would, where I would point out how, even if you do train it, even if all your feedback on the training data points is, is good, if the world changes in some way, uh, the AI system might stop doing good things. Um, and my go-to example, I mean, I, I gave the uh, Gmail with emoji polls for meeting scheduling example, but another one now that I'm on the topic of COVID is like, if you imagine an AI system, if you imagine like a meeting scheduling AI assistant again, uh, that was trained pre-pandemic, uh, and then the pandemic hits, and it's like obviously never been trained on any data that was collected during a pandemic, uh, a like, you know, such a global pandemic. And so it's like, uh, and so when you then ask it to schedule a meeting with, you know, your friend Alice, uh, it just, you know, schedules drinks in a bar uh, on Sunday evening, even though like clearly what you meant was a video call, and it knows that you meant a uh, video call. It's just learned the thing to do is to schedule um, schedule outings with friends on Sunday nights at bars. Uh, Sunday night. I don't know why I'm saying Sunday night. Friday night. Have you been drinking a lot on your Sunday nights? No, not no. even in the slightest. <laughs> yeah. I think really the problem is I don't go to bars, so I don't have a cash day in my, in my okay. head that, that sure. people go to bars. So, so, so how, how, does this, how does this all lead to existential risk? Well, the main argument is like one possibility is that your AI system just actually learns to like ruthlessly maximize some objective uh, that isn't the one that we want. Um, like, you know, make paper clips is a stylized example to show what happens in that, that sort of situation. We're not actually claiming that it will specifically maximize paper clips. Um, but like, you know, an AI system that like really ruthlessly is just trying to maximize paper clips, it is going to prevent humans from stopping it from doing so. 
and if it gets sufficiently intelligent and can take over the world at some point, is just going to turn all of the resources into the world uh, into paper clips, which may or may not include like you know the resources in human bodies. But either way, it's going to include all the resources upon which we depend for survival. Uh, so humans are definitely going like seem like they will definitely go extinct in that scenario. Um, so again, not specific to paper clips. This is just ruthless maximization of an objective tends not to leave humans alive. And it, and and both of these, well, not both of the mechanisms, the inner alignment mechanism that I've been talking about can is compatible with an AI system that ruthlessly maximizes an objective that we don't want. Uh, it does not argue that it is probable, and I am not sure if I think it is probable. I think it is, but I think it is like easily enough risk that we should be like really worrying about it and and trying to reduce it. For the outer alignment style story, where it's um, where the problem is that you know the AI may know information that you don't, and then you give it bad feedback. Uh, I mean, one thing is just this can exacerbate, this can make it easier for an inner alignment style story to happen where the AI learns to optimize an objective that isn't what you actually wanted. Uh, but even if you exclude something like that, Paul Cristiano has written a few posts about what a failure of how a human extinction level failure of this form could look like. And it basically looks like all of your AI systems lying to you about how good the world is um, as the world becomes much, much worse. So for example, you know, AI systems keep telling you that the things that you're buying are, are good and helping your, helping your lives, but actually they're not, and they're making them worse in some subtle way that you can't tell. Uh, like you were told, like as all of the information that you're fed seem, makes it seem like um, you know, there's no crime, police are doing a great job of catching it, but really this is just manipulation of the information you're being fed rather than like actual amounts of crime, uh, where like in this case, maybe the crimes are being com committed by AI systems, not even by humans. Um, so in, in all of these cases, like humans you know, relied on some like information sources to make decisions. Uh, AIs knew other information that the humans didn't, and the AIs learned, hey, my job is to like manage the information sources that humans get so that the humans are happy because that's what they that's when that that's what they did during training they like gave good feedback in cases where the information source said it was said things were going well even when things were not actually going well right i mean it seems like if human beings are constantly giving feedback to AI systems and the feedback is based on incorrect information and the AIs have more information, then they're going to learn something that isn't aligned with what we really want or the truth. Yeah, I do. I do feel like I do feel uncertain about the extent to which this like leads to human extinction without it, it leads to like, I think you can pretty easily make the case that leads to an existential catastrophe uh, as defined by, I want to say it's Bostrom, which is like, you know, includes human extinction, but also a permanent curtailing of humanity's, I forget the exact phrasing, but like basically if humanity can't use, yeah, exactly, um, that counts. And like the, this totally falls in that category. I don't know if it actually leads to human extinction um, without some additional sort of failure that we might instead categorize as inner alignment failure. Let's talk a little bit about probabilities, right? So if you're talking to someone who has never encountered AI alignment before, and, um, you know, you've given a lot of different real world examples and principle based arguments for why there are these different kinds of alignment risks, how would you explain the probability of existential risk to someone who can come along for all of these principle-based arguments and buy into the examples that you've given, but still thinks this seems kind of far out there. Like, when am I ever going to see in the real world a ruthlessly optimizing AI? 
that's capable of ending the world? I think first off, I'm like super sympathetic to the, this seems super out there uh, critique. It's like I spent multiple years not really agreeing with AI safety for basically, well, not just that reason, but that was definitely one of the heuristics that I was using. Um, I think one way I would justify this is to some extent it has precedent here, precedent already in that like fundamentally the arguments that I'm making, well, especially the inner alignment one, um, is a an argument about how AI systems will behave in new situations um, rather than, you know, the ones it has already seen during training. And we already know that AI systems behave crazily in new situations. Uh, at the, the like most famous example of this is adversarial examples, where you take an image classifier, um, I think the Oh man, I don't actually remember what the canonical example is. I think it's like a panda and you like change, change it imperceptibly or change it, change the pixel values by a small amount such that, that you know, the change is imperceptible to the human eye. And then it's confit, it's classified with, I think, 99.8% confidence as something else. My memory is saying airplane, but that might just be totally wrong. Anyway, the point is like we have precedent for it. AI systems behaving really weirdly on in situations they weren't um, trained on. You might object that this one is like a little bit cheating because there was an adversary involved and like the real, I mean, the real world does have adversaries, but still by default you would expect the AI system to be more like uh, exposed to uh, naturally occurring distributions. I think even there though, you like often you can just take an AI system that was trained on one distribution give it inputs from a different distribution. It's just like, ha there's no sen sense to what's happening. Usually when I'm asked to predict this, the, the actual prediction I give is probability that um, we go extinct due to an intent alignment failure. And then some, depending on the situation, I will either condition on, I will either make that unconditional. So that like includes, um, all of the things that people will do to try to prevent that from happening, or I make it conditional on like, you know, the long-termist community doesn't do anything or like vanishes or something. But even in that world, there's still like, you know, everyone who's not a long-termist who can still prevent that from happening, which I like really do expect them to do. Uh, and, and so then I like, I think I give like my, my like cash answer on both of those is like 5% and 10% respectively, which I think is probably the numbers I gave you. If I like actually sat down and like tried to like come up with a probability, I would probably come up with something new, different this time. But I have not done that, and I'm, I'm like way too anchored on those previous estimates to really give you a new estimate this time. Uh, but but the like higher number I'm giving now of like I don't know thirty three percent, fifty percent, seventy percent. This this one's like way more uncertain. I feel way more uncertain about it. Is like literally no one tries to like address these sorts of problems. They just sort of like. Take and take a language model, fine tune it on human feedback in a like very obvious way, and they just deploy that, um, even if it like very obviously was causing harm during training, they they still deploy it. I'm like, what's the chance that leads to human extinction? And I'm like, I don't know, man. Maybe thirty three percent, maybe seventy percent, and like the thirty three percent number you can get from this like, you know, one in three argument that I was talking about. The second thing I was going to say is like, I don't really like talking about probabilities very much because of how utterly arbitrary uh, the methods of generating them are. They're like, um, I, I, I feel much more, I feel much more robust, uh, or I feel much better in the robustness of the conclusion that like, we don't know that this won't happen and it is at least plausible that it does happen. And I think that's like pretty sufficient for justifying the work done on it. I will also like argue pretty strongly against anyone who says we know that it will kill us all if we don't do anything. I, I like don't think that's true. Um, 
there are definitely, you know, smart people who do think that's true. Um, if we like operationalize no as like, you know, greater than 90, 95% or something. Um, and, and I disagree with them. Um, I don't really know why though. How would you respond to someone who thinks that this sounds like it's really far in the future? Um, yeah, so this is like specifically like AGI is far in the future. Yeah, well, so the concern here seems to be about machines that are increasingly capable. Mm -hmm. And when people look at machines that we have today, like machine learning that we have today, sometimes they're not super impressed and think that general capabilities are very far off. And so yeah. this stuff sounds like future stuff. Yeah. So I think my response depends on like, you know, what we're trying to get the person to do or something. Like why, why, why do we care about what this person believes? Um, if this person is like considering whether or not to do AI research themselves or AI safety research themselves, and they feel like they have a strong inside view model of like why AI is not going to come soon. I'm kind of the, you know, I'm like, eh, that seems okay. I'm, I'm like not that stoked about people being f like forcing themselves to do research on a thing they don't actually believe. I don't really think good research comes from do from doing that. Like it, I, I, if I put myself like, for example, I, I am much more sold on like, um, AGI coming through neural networks than like planning agents or, or things similar to it. And if I had to like put myself in the shoes of like, all right, I'm now going to do AI safety research on planning agents. I'm just like, oh man, that seems like I'm going to do so much. My work is going to be like orders of magnitude worse than, than the work I do on, uh, in the neural net case. So if, so in the case where I'm like, you know, this person is like thinking about whether to do AI safety research and they feel like they have strong inside view models uh, for AGI not coming soon. I'm like, eh, maybe they should go do something else. Um, or possibly they should like engage with the arguments for AGI coming more, more quickly if they haven't done that. But if they've like, you know, engaged with those arguments, thought about it all, concluded it's far away and they like can't even see a picture by which it comes soon. I'm like, you know, that's fine. Conversely, if we're instead, if we're imagining that like someone is disputing, oh, someone is saying, oh, nobody should work on AI safety right now because AGI is so far away. Um, I mean, one, one response you can have to that is like, it's, you know, even if it's far away, it's still worthwhile to work on reducing risks uh, if they're as bad as extinction. Uh, it seems like we should be putting effort into that even early on. But I think, you know, you can make a stronger argument there, which is like, you know, there are just actually people, lots of people who are trying to build AGI right now. There's, you know, at the minimum, DeepMind and OpenAI. Uh, and they clearly, I should probably not make more comments about DeepMind, but OpenAI clearly um doesn't believe uh the opening i clearly seems to think that like agi is coming uh somewhat soon and i think you can infer from everything you see about deep mind that they don't believe that agi is you know 200 years away i i think it is like insane overconfidence in your own views uh to be thinking that you know better than all of these people um such that you wouldn't even assign like, you know, 5% or something uh, to AGI coming soon enough for that, that work on AI safety matters. Um, yeah, so, so there I think I would appeal to, you know, let other people do the work. You are not, you don't have to do the work yourself. There's just no reason for you to be opposing the other people. Uh, either either on epistemic grounds or also on just like, you know, it's kind of a waste of your own time. Um, so that's the second kind of person. And the third kind of person might be like somebody in policy. From my impression of policy is that there is this thing where like early moves are relatively irreversible or something like that. Things get entrenched pretty quickly. 
um, such that it makes sense to wait for, it often makes sense to like wait for a consensus before acting. And like, I don't think that there is currently consensus of AGI coming soon. Um, and I don't feel particularly confident enough in my views to say like, we should really like convince policy people to override this general heuristic of waiting for consensus. Um, and get them to act now. Uh, yeah. Anyway, those were all meta-level considerations. There's also the object-level question of, like, is AGI coming soon? Uh, for that, I would say, I think the most likely, the, the best story for that I know of is you take, you know, you, you take neural nets, you, as you, you scale them up, uh, you increase the size of the size of the data sets that they're, tra that they're trained on. You increase the diversity of the data sets that they're trained on. Um, and like they learn more and more general heuristics um, for like doing good things. And like eventually these general these heuristics are like general enough that they're like as good as human human brain comp uh, human cognition. Uh, implicitly, I am claiming that human cognition is like basically a bag of general heuristics. There is this um, report from Ajay Akotra uh, uh, about AGI timelines using biological anchors. And I mean, I wrote even my summary of it was like 3,000 words or something like that. So I don't know that I can really give an adequate summary of it here. Uh, but it like models, it, the basic premise is to model how quickly uh, neural nets will grow um, and at what point they will match what we would expect the, what would be, we would expect to be approximately the same rough size as uh, the human brain. I think it even includes a small penalty to neural nets on the basis that like um, evolution probably did a better job than, than we did. It basically comes up with a target for like, you know, neural nets of this size trained in like compute optimal ways will probably be like roughly human level. Um, and it has a distribution over this to be more accurate. And then it like predicts based on existing trends um, and, well, not just existing trends, existing trends and like sensible extrapolation uh, predicts when neural nets might reach that level. And it ends up concluding like somewhere in the range. Oh, let me see if I, I think it's 50% confidence interval would be something like 20, 35 to 20, 70, 20, 80, maybe something like that. I am really just like, you know, I'm imagining a graph in my head and trying to like calculate the area under it. So, so that is very much not a reliable interval, but it should give you a general sense of what the, what the report concludes. So that's 2030 to 2080. I think it's a slightly narrower than, narrower than that, but yes, roughly, roughly that. That's pretty soon. Yep. I think like that's on the object level, you just gotta, gotta read the report and see whether or not you buy it. That's like, most likely in our lifetimes, if we live to the average age. Yep. So that, so that was a 50% interval, meaning it's like, um, 25% to 75 percentile. I think actually the 25th percentile was, tw was not as early as 2030. It was probably 2040. So if, if, if I've heard everything, you know, the, the, in this podcast, everything that you've said so far, and I'm still kind of like, okay, this, like, there's a lot here and it sounds like maybe convincing or something. And um, it's, this seems important, but I'm like, not so sure that about this or that we should do anything. You know, what is, 
because it seems like there's a lot of people like that. I'm curious what it is that, that, that you would say to, to someone like that. I think I'd, I don't know. I probably wouldn't try to say something general to them. I feel like I would need to know more about the person. Like people have pretty different idiosyncratic reasons for having that sort of reaction. I mean, okay. I would at least say that I think that they are wrong to be having that sort of belief or reaction. Uh, but if I wanted to like convince them of that point, uh, presumably I would have to say something more than just, I think you are wrong. Um, and I think the specific thing I would have to say would, would be pretty different for, for different people. That's um, a fair point. I like maybe would at least, I would maybe make an appeal to like the meta level heuristic of like, don't try to regulate like a small group of, you know, barrel, a few hundred researchers at most doing things that they think will help the world and that you don't think will hurt the world. There are just better things for you to do with your time. Doesn't seem like they're harming you. Um, uh, I, some people will think that there, there, there is harm being caused by, caused by them. So I, I would have to address that with them specifically. But I think most people do not, who, who have this reaction, don't believe that. So, so we've gone over a lot of the, the, the traditional arguments for AI as a potential existential risk. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add there or any of the arguments that we, we missed that you would like to include? As a representative of the representative of the community as a whole, uh, there are lots of other arguments that people like to make um, for AI being a potential extinction risk. Uh, so some some things are like, you know, maybe AI just like accelerates the rate at which we make progress, and we can't uh, increase our wisdom um, alongside, and as a result, we get a lot of destructive technologies and can't keep them under control or like we don't do enough philosophy in order to figure out what we actually care about and what's good to do in the world and as a result the like um we like start optimizing for for things that are morally bad um or or like uh other things in this vein uh talk about the you know uh the risk of ai being misused by bad actors um, so there's, well, actually I'll introduce a trichotomy that, that I forget. I, yeah, I don't, I don't remember exactly who, who wrote this article, but, um, it goes accidents, misuse and structural risks. So accidents are, you know, both alignment and the, um, things like we don't keep up, uh, we don't have enough wisdom to, uh, to cope with the impacts of AI. That one's arguable whether it's an accident or misuse or structural. Um, and we don't do enough philosophy. So those are like vaguely accidental. Uh, those are like accidents. Misuse is like some bad actor, some terrorist, say, gets AI, uh, gets like a powerful AI system and does something really bad, like blows up the world somehow. Structural risks are um, things like Various parts of the economy like use AI to accelerate, to, to get more profit, to accelerate their production of goods and so on. Um, and at some point they just like, we like have this like giant economy that's just making a lot of goods, but it becomes decoupled from things that are actually, you know, useful for humans. And uh, we just have this like huge multi-agent system uh, where goods are being produced, money's flowing around, we don't really understand all of it, but somehow humans get left behind. And there it's like not, it's kind of an accident, but not in the traditional sense. Like it's not that like a single AI system went and did something bad. Um, it's more like the entire structure of how the way that the AI systems and the humans related to each other was such that it ended up leading to permanent disempowerment of humans. Uh, now that I say it, I think probably the like, we didn't have enough wisdom 
um, argument for risk is probably also in this category. Which of these categories are you most worried about? I don't know. I think it is probably not misuse, but I like, I vary on accidents versus structural risks. Mostly because I just like don't feel like I have a good understanding of structural risks. Uh, maybe most days I think structural risks are more likely to cause that uh, extinction. The sort of obvious next question is like, why am I working on alignment and not structural risks? Uh, and the answer there is that it seems to me like alignment has like one or perhaps two like core problems that are like leading to the to the major risk. Whereas like structural risks, and, and so you could hope to like have a like one or two solutions that address those main problems. Um, and then like, that's it, that's all you need. Uh, whereas with structural risks, I like would be surprised if it was just, there was just like one or two solutions that just like got rid of structural risk. It seems much more like you have to have a different solution for each of the structural risks. So it seems like you know, the amount that you can reduce the risk by is higher in alignment than in structural risks. Um, and that's, I mean, that's not the only reason why I work in alignment. I'm all, I'm all, I just also have a much better personal fit with, with alignment work. But I do also think that alignment work, you have more opportunity to reduce the risk than in structural risks on the current margin. Is there a name for those one or two core problems in alignment that you could come oh, up with solutions for? I mostly just mean like, I mean, possibly like, you know, we've been talking about outer and inner alignment. And like in the neural net case, I talked about, you know, the problem where the, you reward the AI system for doing bad things because there was an information asymmetry. And then like the other one was like the AI system generalizes catastrophically to new situations. Arguably, those are just the two things. Um, but but I think it's not even that. It's more like, you know, fundamentally the story, the like causal chain in in the accidents case is like the AI was trying to do something bad or something that we didn't want rather. And then that was bad. Whereas like in the structural risks case, there isn't like a single causal story. Um, it's this sort of very vague general notion of like the humans and AIs interacted in ways that led to a next risk. Uh, um, and then you like, if you drill down into any, any given story, or if you get drilled down into like five stories and then you're like, what's common across these five stories? You're like, not much other than that there was AI and there were humans and they interacted. Uh, and I like, wouldn't say that was true. in if I had like five stories about alignment failure, so uh, I'd like to take a overview, like a broad's eye view of AI alignment in 2021. The last time we spoke was in 2020. So how has AI alignment as a field of research changed in the last year? I think I'm going to naturally include a bunch of things from 2020 as well. It's not a very sharp division in my mind. Um, especially because I think the like biggest trend is just more focus on um, large language models, uh, which I think was a trend that started late 2020, probably. Uh, certainly, you know, the GPT-3 paper was, I, I want to say early 2020, um, but I don't think it like immediately caused there to be more work. So, so maybe late 2020 is about right. Uh, but you just see a lot more, um, you know, alignment forum posts and, and papers that are grappling with like, what do you, what are the alignment problems that could arise with large language models? How might you fix them? Um, there is this, you know, paper out of, um, Stanford, which isn't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said this was like from the AI safety community, uh, but it, you know, gives the name foundation models to these sorts of things. Um, so they generalize it beyond just language. 
um, and you know they think it might you know, and already we've seen some generalization beyond language like Clip and Dolly um, are working on image inputs, uh, but they also like extend it to like robotics and so on. And their point is like you know we're now more in the realm of like you, know, you train one large model on a bunch of like a giant pile of data that you happen to have uh, that you don't really have any like labels for, but you can use a uh, self-supervised learning objective in order to learn from them. And then you get this model that has a lot of knowledge, but no like goal built in. And then you do something like prompt engineering or fine tuning in order to actually um, get it to do the task that you want. Um, and so that's like a, new paradigm for constructing AI systems that we didn't have before. Uh, and there have just been a bunch of posts that uh, grapple with, you know, what alignment looks like in this sort of, in, in this case. I don't think I have like a nice pithy summary, unfortunately, of like what all of us, what the upshot is. But that's the thing that people have been, cons people have been thinking about a lot more. Why do you think that looking at large scale language models has become a thing? Oh, I think primarily just because GPT-3 demonstrated um, how powerful they could be. Uh, you just see, this is not specific to the AI safety community, even in um, them. Like if anything, this uh, shift that I'm talking about is it's probably not more pronounced in, in, in the ML community, but it's also there in the ML community where there are just like tons of papers about prompt engineering and fine tuning out of regular ML labs. Um, it's just, I think it's like GPT-3 showed that it could be done and that this was like a reasonable way to get uh, actual economic value out of these systems. Um, and so people started caring about them more. So uh, one thing that you mentioned to me that was significant in the last year was foundation models. So could you explain what foundation models are? Yeah. So a foundation model, the general recipe for it is you take this some very, not generic exactly, flexible input space like pixels or any English, English language any string of words in the English language. Uh, you collect a giant uh, data set um, without any particular labels, just like lots of examples of that sort of uh, data in the wild. So in the case of pixels, you just like find a bunch of images from like image sharing websites or something. I don't actually know where they got their images from. For, for text, it's even easier. You know, the internet is filled with text. You just get a bunch of it. Um, and then you train your AI, you train a very large neural network uh, with some proxy objective uh, on, on that data set that encourages it to like learn how to model that data set. So in the case of uh, language models, the, I mean, there are a bunch of possible objectives. Uh, the most famous one is the one that GPT-3 used. Uh, which is just, you know, given the first n words of the sentence, predict the uh, word n plus one. Um, and so it just like, you know, initially it starts learning like e's are the most common let, well, actually, because of the specific way that the input space in GPT-3 works, it doesn't exactly do this. But you could imagine that if it was just modeling characters, it would first learn that like e's are the most common letter in the alphabet, vowels are more common, Q's and Z's don't come up that often. So like it starts, you know, outputting letter distributions that like at least look a vaguely more like what English would look like. Um, then it starts learning what, you know, the spelling of individual words are. Uh, then it starts learning what the grammar rules are. Just these are all things that help it better predict what the next word is going to be. Um, or well, the next character in this particular um, instantiation and you know it turns out that you know when when you have like millions of parameters in your neural network then you can like 
I don't I don't actually know if this number is a, is right, but like probably I would expect that with millions of parameters in your neural network, you can do like learn, you know, spellings of words, letter well spellings of words and rules of grammar such that you're like mostly outputting, you know, for the most part grammatically correct sentences, but they have they they like don't necessarily mean very much. And then when you get to like the billions of parameters uh, arrange, at that point, like, you know, you know, the millions of parameters were already getting you grammar. So like, what, what should it use all these extra parameters for now? Then it starts learning things like, you know, George, well, probably already, even the millions of parameters probably learned that George tends to be followed by Washington, but it can like start learning things like that. And in that sense can be said to know that there is a entity at least named George Washington and so on, it might start knowing that rain is wet and like in contexts where, you know, something has been rained on and then later we're asked to describe that thing, it will like say it's wet or slippery or something like that. And so it like starts basically just in order to predict words better, it like keeps getting more and more knowledge um, about the domain. So anyway, a foundation model, expressive input space, giant pile of data, very big neural net, learns to model that domain very well, which like involves getting a bunch of knowledge about that domain. <laughs> um, What's the difference between knowledge and knowledge? Uh, I mean, I feel like you're the philosopher here okay. uh, more than me. <laughs> do, know. You, do you know what <laughs> knowledge without air quotes is? No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to derail it, but it, yeah. So it's yeah. So it gets knowledge. Yeah, I mostly put the air quotes around knowledge because, like, we don't really have a satisfying account of what knowledge is, and like, if I don't put air quotes around knowledge, I get lots of people angrily saying that AI systems don't have knowledge yet. Oh yeah, that makes and sense. When I put the air quotes around it, then they understand that I just mean that it, like, you know, has the ability to make predictions that are mm -hmm. conditional on like this particular fact about the world whether or not it like actually knows that fact about that world <laughs> about the world okay but like it knows sure. it well enough to do to make predictions or, or it contains the knowledge well enough to make predictions it can make predictions that's the point i'm being maybe a bit more too um harsh here like i also put air quotes around knowledge because i don't actually know what knowledge is it's not just a like defense strategy, though that is definitely part of it. So yeah, foundation models um, basically are a way to like just get all of this knowledge uh, into into an AI system, such that you can then do like prompting and fine tuning and so on. And those like with a very small amount of data, relatively speaking, um, are able to get very good performance. So like in the case of GPT-3, you can like give it, you know, two or three examples of a task and it can start performing that task if the task is relatively simple. Whereas if you wanted to train a model from scratch to perform that task, you would need like thousands or more thousands of examples often. So how has this been significant for AI alignment? I think it has mostly like provided an actual pathway to wit by which we can get to AGI uh, or like it there's like more like a concrete story and path that like leads to AGI eventually and so then we can take all of these abstract arguments that we were making before and then see try to like instantiate them in the case of this concrete pathway and see whether or not they still make sense I'm not sure if at this point I'm like imagining what I would like to do versus what actually happened. I would need to actually go and look through the alignment newsletter database and see what people actually wrote about the subject. But like, I think there was like some d discussion of like GPT-3 and the extent to which it is or isn't a Mesa optimizer. Um, yeah. That's at least one thing that I remember happening. Then there's been there's been a lot of like papers that are just like, here is how you can do um, here is how you can like train a foundation model like GPT three, uh, to do the sort of thing that you want. So like there's, uh, learning to summarize from human feedback, which just took GPT three and like taught it how to, 
or, or fine-tuned it in order to get it to summarize news articles, which is like an example of a task that you might want an AI system to do. Um, and then like the same team at OpenAI just recently released a paper that like actually summarized entire books by using a recursive decomposition strategy. Um, so there's been some amount, there's like, in some sense, a lot of the work we've been doing in the past in AI line was like, how do we get AI systems to perform fuzzy tasks for which we don't have a reward function? And now we have systems that like could do these fuzzy tasks in the sense that they like have the knowledge, but like don't actually, you know, use that knowledge um, the way that we would want them. And now we like have to figure out how to get them to do that. And then we can use all these techniques like imitate imitation learning and learning from comparisons and preferences that we've we've been developing. Why don't we know that AI systems won't totally kill us all? The arguments for AI risk usually depend on having an AI system that's like ruthlessly maximizing an objective in every new situation it encounters. So like for example, the paperclip maximizer, you know, once it's built 10 paperclip factories, it doesn't it's it doesn't retire and say, yep, that that's enough paper clips. Uh, it like just, you know, continues turning like entire planets into into paper clips. Um, similarly, uh, or if you like consider the goal of like make a hundred paper clips, then it like turns the turns all of the planets into uh, computers to verify that it, it to make sure it is as confident as possible that it has made a hundred paper clips. Um, like these are like examples of I'm gonna call ruthlessly ruthlessly maximizing an an objective. Uh, and like there's some sense in which this is weird, and like humans don't behave in that way. Uh, and I think there's some amount of like, basically I am unsure whether or not we should actually expect AIs to have such ruthlessly maximized objectives. I don't really see the argument for why, why that should happen. And I think like as a particularly strong piece of evidence against this, I would note that like humans don't seem to have these sorts of objectives. Um, it's not obviously true. There are probably some long-termists who like really do want to tile the universe with hedonium, which seems like a pretty ruthlessly maximizing objective to me. Uh, but I think even even then, the, those are like that's the exception rather than the rule. Um, so like if humans don't maximize uh, ruthlessly maximize objectives, and humans were built by like a similar process uh, as is building neural networks. Why do we expect the neural networks to have um, objectives that they ruthlessly maximize? You can also, you know, I've phrased this in a way where, I, where it's an argument against AI risk. You can also phrase it in a way in which it's an argument for AI risk, where you would say, well, you know, let's flip that on its, on its head and say like, well, yes, you brought up the example of humans. Well, the process that created humans is trying to maximize or like, you know, it is a thing, it is, a, an optimization process leading to increased reproductive fitness, but then humans do things like wear condoms, which does not seem great for reproductive fitness, generally speaking, um, especially, you know, for the people who are definitely out there who like decide that they're just never going to reproduce. So in that sense, like humans are clearly like having a, a large impact on the world uh, and are doing so for objectives that are not what evolution was naively optimizing. Um, and so like similarly, if we train AI systems in the same way, maybe they too will like have a large impact on the world, but not for what the humans were, were naively, you know, training the system to optimize. We, we can't let them know about fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, terrible. They must, they must, yeah, well, I don't want to the be whole human AI alignment project will run off the rails. Um, yeah. But anyway, I think like just these things are like a lot more conceptually tricky than 
uh, the, you know, well-polished arguments that one reads will make it seem. Um, but especially this point about, like, it's not obvious that AI systems will get ruthlessly maximizing objectives. Like, that really does give me a, quite a bit of pause um, in how good the AI risk arguments are. I still think it is, like, clearly correct to be working on AI risk because, like, we don't want to be in the situation where, we're like, we can't make an argument for why AI is risky. We want to be in the situation where we're, like, we can make an argument for why the AI is not risky. Uh, and I don't think we have that situation yet. Even if you, like, completely buy the, like, we don't know if there's going to be ruthlessly maximizing objectives argument, that puts you in the epistemic state where we're, like, well, I don't see an ironclad argument that says that AIs will kill us all. And that's sort of like saying, like, I don't know. Well, I don't have an ironclad argument that touching this pan that's on this, you know, lit stove will burn me. Because, you know, maybe someone just put the pan on the stove a few seconds ago. Uh, but it would still be a bad idea to, to go and do that. What you really want is a, you know, positive argument for why the pan, why touching the pan is not going to burn you, or analogously, why building the AGI is not going to kill you. Um, and I don't think we have any such positive argument uh, at the moment. Part of this conversation is interesting because I'm like surprised how uncertain you are about AI as an existential risk. Yeah. It's possible I've become slightly more uncertain about it in the last year or two. I don't think I was saying things quite quite this much. Quite, uh, I don't think I was saying things that were quite this uncertain before then. But I think I um, have generally been like, you know, we have plausibility arguments. We do not have like, this is probable arguments. Or, you know, back in like 2017 or 2018 when I was young and naive, uh, Okay. <laughs> this this makes We're more no sense. longer young and naive. Well, okay. I I like entered the field of AI alignment. I like read my first AI alignment paper in like September of 2017. So so this it it, it actually does make sense. Uh, at that time, I thought we had more confidence um, of some sort. But but like since posting the value learning sequence, I've generally been like more uncertain about AI risk arguments. I don't, I don't like talk about it all that much because as I said, the decision is still very clear. The decision is still like work on this problem, figure out how to get a positive argument that the AI is not going to kill us. Uh, and ideally, you know, a positive argument that the AI does good things for humanity. I don't know, man, most things in life are pretty uncertain. Most things in the future are like even way, way, way more uncertain. Um, I don't feel like you should generally be all that confident about technologies that you're that you think are decades out. Feels a little bit like those uh, those images of the people in the fifties drawing what the future would look like, and everyone and the images are like ridiculous. Yep. Yeah, I. I've been recently watching Star Wars. Now, obviously, Star Wars is not actually a, supposed to be a prediction about the future, but it's it's really quite entertaining to to like actually just think about all the ways in which Star Wars would be totally inaccurate. And this is like before we've even invented uh, space travel, but just like robots talking to each other using sound. <laughs> Why would they do that? Industry today wouldn't make machines that speak by vibrating air. They would just like send each other signals electromagnetically. Yep. So how much of the alignment and safety problems in AI do you think will be solved by industry? The same way that like computer to computer communication is solved by industry and is not what Star Wars yep. thought it would be. Um, would the DeepMind AI Safety Lab exist 
if DeepMind didn't think that AI alignment and AI safety were serious and important? Like, I don't know if the lab is purely aligned with the commercial interests of DeepMind itself, or if it's also kind of seen as like a good for the world thing. I bring it up because I like uh, how Andrew Critch talks about it in his uh, Arches uh, paper. Yep. So Critch is, I think, of the opinion that like both preference learning and robustness are problems that will be solved by uh, industry. I think he includes robustness in that. Um, and I like certainly agree to the extent that you're like, yes, companies will do things like uh, learning from human preferences. Totally, they're de they're gonna do that. Uh, whether they're going to like be proactive enough to notice um, the the kinds of failures I mentioned, I don't know. It doesn't seem nearly as obvious to me that they will be uh, without like you know dedicated teams that are specifically meant for looking at, you know, uh, looking for hidden failures with the knowledge that like these are really important to get because they could have very bad long-term consequences. AI systems could uh, increase the strength of and accelerate uh, various multi-agent systems and processes that when accelerated uh, could lead to bad outcomes. So for example, uh, a great example of a destructive multi-agent system, a multi-agent effect is like war. Uh, you know, war is a thing that like, uh, well, I mean, wars have been getting more destructive over time. Um, but, or at least the weapons in them have been getting more destructive. Probably the death tolls have also been getting higher, but I'm not as sure about that. Um, and you could imagine that if AI systems uh, continue to increase, if like they increase the destructiveness of weapons even more, uh, wars might then become an existential risk. Uh, so that's like a way in which um, you can get a structural risk from a multi-agent system. Um, the and the example in which like the economy just sort of becomes much 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 bigger uh, but becomes decoupled from things that humans want uh, is another example of how a multi-agent process can sort of go haywire uh, especially with the addition of AI's powerful AI systems I think that's also a canonical scenario that Critch would think about um, yeah so that's yeah the it's re really, I would say that like Arches is, I, in my head, it's categorized as like a technical paper about structural risks. Do you think about what beneficial futures look like? You spoke a little bit about wisdom earlier, and I, I'm curious what good futures with AI looks like to you. Yeah, um, I, I admit I don't actually think about this very much. Because I'm fo my research is focused on more abstract problems, I tend to focus on abstract considerations and like the main abstract consideration from the perspective of the good future is like, well, once, once we get to, you know, singularity levels of powerful AI systems, like anything I say now, there's going to be something way better that the, that AI systems are going to enable. Uh, so then as a result, I don't think very much about it. You work a lot on this risk. So you must think that humanity existing in the future matters. I mean, I do I do like humans. Humans are pretty great. I count many of them amongst as amongst my friends. I've never been all that good at the sort of trans the transhumanist look to the future and see the grand potential of humanity uh, sorts of visions. But like when other people say them or give them, I like feel a lot of kinship with them. You know, the, the ones that are all about, like, you know, humanity's potential to, like, discover new forms of art and music, uh, reach new levels of science, understand the world better than it's ever been understood before, fall in love a uh, hundred times, you know, just 
uh, learn all of the things that there are to know. Actually, you won't be able to do that one probably, but anyway, learn way more of the things that there are to know than you, than, than you have right now. Uh, like, just a lot of that resonates with me. And that's probably a very intellectual-centric um, view of the future. Uh, I feel like I, I'd be interested in in hearing the, like, you know, view of the future that's like, ah, oh, yes, we, like, have the best, you know, video games and the best TV shows and we, we're, we're the best couch potatoes that ever were. Um, or also there are just, like, you know, insane new sports that you have to, like, spend... Uh, lots of time and grueling training for it, but it's all worth it when you, like, uh, you know, shoot the best, you know, get a perfect 50 on, perfect score on, like, the best uh, dunk that's ever been done in basketball or whatever. Um, I recently watched a competition of, like, apparently there are competitions in basketball of, like, um, just, like, aesthetic uh, dunks. It's, it's cool. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Anyway. Um, yeah, it feels like there are just so many other communities that could also have their own visions of the future, and I feel like I'd, I'd um, feel a lot of kinship with many of those, too. And I'm like, man, let's just have all the humans just continue to do the things that they want. Seems great. One thing that you mentioned was that you deal with abstract problems, and so what a good future looks like to you is a little, it seems like it's like an abstract problem that later the good things that AI can give us are better than the good things that we can think of right now. Is that a fair summary? That seems right. Yeah. Right. So there's like, there's this view and this comes from maybe Steven Pinker or someone else. I'm not sure. Or maybe Ray Kurzweil. I, I don't know. Um, where, you know, if you give a caveman a genie or, like, an AI, they'll ask for maybe, like, a bigger cave and, like, I would like there to be more hunks of meat and I would like my, like, pelt for my bed to be a little bit bigger. Go ahead. Okay, I think I see the issue. So I actually don't agree with your summary of the thing that I said. Um, oh, okay. I said that uh, your, your rephrasing was that um, the we like ask the AI what good things there are to do, uh -huh. um, or something like that, and that might have been what I said, but what I actually meant, um, was that like with powerful AI systems, like the world will just be very different, and like one of the ways in which it will be different is that we can get advice from AIs on what to do, um, and certainly that's an important one, uh. But also there will just be like incredible new technologies uh, that we don't know about, new realms of science to explore, uh, new concepts that we like don't even have the have names for right now. And one that seems particularly interesting to me is just like entirely new senses. Like I just have like, you know, we human vision is just like incredibly complicated, but like I can just look around the room and identify all the objects with basically no conscious thought. What would it be like to like understand DNA at that level? Like AlphaFold probably understands DNA at some, maybe not quite that level, but something like it. Um, like, I don't know, man. So, there's just like all these things that I'm like, you know, I thought of the DNA one because of AlphaFold. Before AlphaFold would I have thought of it, probably not. I don't know. Maybe Crystal has written a little bit about things like this. But, like, it feels like there will just be, like, far more opportunities. And then also we can get advice from AIs. But, like, that's probably... Actually, and, and that's important, but I think less than they... There are far more opportunities that, like, I am definitely not going to be able to think of today. Do you think that it's dissimilar from the caveman, like, wishing for more caveman things? Yeah. Like, I feel like the... In the, the, the caveman story... Like, if the cave, like, it's possible that the caveman does this, but I feel like the, the thing that the caveman should be doing is, like, something like, you know, give me new, give me, like, better ways to, like, uh, to, to get, 
give me better food or something and then like you get fired to cook things or something like yeah. the things that he asked for should like involve technology um as as a solution he should get technology as a solution he should like learn more and be able to do more things as a result of having that technology and like you know in this hypothetical at the ca the caveman should like reasonably quickly become like similar to modern humans i don't know what reasonably quickly means here but like it should be much more like you know you get access to more and more technologies rather than like you get a bigger cave and then you're like i have no more wishes anymore just like i'm like if i got a bigger house would i stop having wishes that seems super unlikely um i think i like that's a straw man argument, sorry. But still, I, I like do feel like there is a, just a meaningful sense in which like getting new technology leads to just genuinely new circumstances, uh, which leads to more opportunities, which leads to like probably more technology and so on. And like at some point this has to stop. Um, there are like limits to what is possible. One assumes there are limits to what is possible in the universe. Uh, but I think like once we once we get to talking about we're at those limits then i'm like you know at that point it's like <laughs> probably at that point it just seems irresponsible to speculate it's just so wildly out of the range of things that we know like at that point i'm like there are probably just not the the concept of a person is probably wrong at that point the what of a person is probably wrong at that point the concept of a person oh I'd be like, is there an is there an entity that I would that that is Rohan at that time? I'm like, not likely. Less than fifty percent. We'll edit in just like uh, fractals flying through <laughs> your video <laughs> at this part of the interview. So, in my example, I think it's just because I think I think of cavemen as not knowing how to ask for new technology, but we want to be able to ask for new technology. Um, and part of what this brings up for me is this very classic part of AI alignment, and I'm curious how you feel like it fits into the problem. But we would also like AI systems to help us imagine beneficial futures potentially or to know like what is good or what it is that, that, that we want. So in asking for new technology, it knows that fire is part of the good that we don't know how to necessarily ask for directly. How do you how do you view AI alignment in terms of itself aiding in the creation of beneficial futures and knowing what is knowing of a good that is beyond the good that hu humanity can grasp? I think I'm more like reject the premise of the question where I'd be like there is no good beyond that which humanity can grasp this is like somewhat of an anti-realist position um and like you mean moral anti-realist just yes for the yeah. yes sorry i should have said that more clearly yeah somewhat of a moral anti-realist position but it's like you know there is no good other than that which humans can grasp and like you know within that could grasp that you can like you know have humans thinking for a very long time you could have them like with extra you can make them more intelligent. Like part of the technologies you get from AI systems uh, will presumably let you do that. Maybe you can like, um, I guess, setting aside questions of like identi philosophical identity, you could like upload the humans such that they could run on a computer, run much faster, have like software upgrades to the, you know, to the extent that that's philosophically acceptable. So like, you know, there's a lot you can do to help humans grasp more. Um, and like ultimately, I'm like, yes, the, the like closure of all these improvements, what where where you get to with all of that, that's just like is the thing that we want. And like, yes, you could have a theory that there is something even better and even more out there uh, that humans can never access by themselves. And I'm like, that just seems like a weird hypothesis to have, and I don't know why you would have it. But in the world where that hypothesis is true, I'm like, I don't know. Like, if I condition on that hypothesis being true, I don't see why we should expect that AI systems could access that further truth. 
um, any better than we can. If it's like out of our, like, you know, the closure of what we can achieve, even with additional intelligence and such, like there's no other advantage that AI systems have over us. So is, is what you're arguing that, um, with human augmentation and help to human beings, so like with uploads or with, you know, expanding the intelligence and capabilities of humans, that humans have access to the entire space of what counts as good. You're, you're like, I think you're like presuming the existence of an object that is the entire space of what is good. And I'm like, there is no such object. There are only uh -huh. humans and what humans want to do. And like, if you want to define the space of what, what is good, you can like define this like closure property on like what humans will think is good, like with all of the possible intelligence augmentations and time and so on. And like, mm -hmm. that's a reasonable object. And I like, I, I could see calling that as the like space of what is good, but then like almost tautologically, we can reach it with te technology. That's the thing I'm talking about. Um, the version where you like posit the existence of the like entire space of what is good is that, like, A, I can't really conceive of that. I like don't, it doesn't feel very coherent to me, but B, when I try to reason about it anyway, I'm like, okay, if humans can't access it, why why should AIs be able to access it? You know, you've posited this new object of like a space of things that humans can never access. But like, how does that space affect or interact with reality in any way? Like there needs to be some sort of interaction in order for the AI to be able to access it. I think I would need to know more about the how it interacts with reality in some way before I could like meaningfully answer this question in a way that like where I could say how AIs could do something that like humans couldn't even in principle do. What do you think of the importance or non-importance of these kinds of questions and how they fit into the ongoing problem of AI alignment? I think they're important. Um, for determining what the goal of alignment should be. So for example, you now know a little bit of what my view on these questions is, uh, which is namely something like it's, you know, that which humans can access, access under like sufficient augmentations, intelligence, time, so on, is like all that there is. And so I'm, I'm like pretty very into like, build AI systems that are like replicating human reasoning that are sort of approximating what a human would do if they thought for a long time or were smarter in some ways and so on. Um, and so then like, yeah, we don't need to worry much about like, or, or so I'm, I, I tend to think of it as like, let's build AI system to, systems that just do tasks that humans can conceptually understand. And not necessarily they can do it, but they like know what that sort of task is. And then our job is to like, you know, the, the entire human AI society is like making forward progress um, towards making forward moral progress or other progress um, in the same way that it has happened in the past, which is like we get exposed to new situations and new arguments. We like think about them for a while and then somehow we make decisions about what's good and what's not in a way that's like somewhat in inscrutable. Um, and like, so I, I'm much more about, and so we just continue iterating that process and eventually we like reach the space of, you know, or, well, yeah, we just continue iterating that process. So I'm like very much into the, like, because of this view, I think it's pretty reasonable to like aim for AI systems that are just like, doing human-like reasoning, but better. Um, or like approximating what, you know, doing what a human could do in a year in like a, a few minutes or something like that. That seems great to me. Whereas if you, on the other hand, were like, no, there's actually like deep philosophical truths out there that humans might never be able to access, then you're probably less enthusiastic about that sort of plan. And you want to do, you want to build AI systems some other way. Or maybe they're accessible with the augmentation and time. Um, 
how how does how does other minds fit into this for you? So like right there's the, the human mind and then the space of all that is good that it has access to with augmentation, which is what you call the space of that which is good. Um, it's contingent and rooted on the space of what the human mind augmented has access to. Um, mm-hmm. How would you view, uh, how does that fit in with animals and also other species which may have their own alignment problems on planets within our cosmic endowment that we might run into? Is it just that they also have spaces that are defined as good as what they can access through their own augmentation and then there's no way of reconciling these two different AI alignment projects? Yeah, I think basically, yes. Like, you know, if, if I met a, like actual rootless maximizing paperclip, uh, paperclip maximizer, uh-huh. it's not like I can argue it into adopting human, my, my values or anything even resembling them. I don't think it would be able to argue me into accepting, you know, turning my turning me into paper clips, uh, which is, you know, what it desires. And like, yeah, that, 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 that just seems like the description of reality. Um, again, a moral realist might say something else, but I've never really understood that the flavor of moral realism that would say something else in that situation. With regards to the planet and industry and how industry will be creating increasingly capable AI systems, could you explain what a unipolar scenario is and what a multipolar scenario is? Yeah. So I'm not sure if I recall exactly where these terms were defined, but a unipolar scenario, at least as I understand it, uh, would be a situation in which one entity basically has determines the long run future of the earth. Um, so like it's in, you know, more colloquially, it has taken over the world. You can also have like a time bounded version of it where it's like, you know, unipolar for like 20 years and like this entity has like all the power for those 20 years but then like you know maybe the entity is a human and we haven't solved aging yet and then the human dies uh so then like it was a unipolar world for that that period of time um and a multipolar world is just you know not that there there's no like one entity that is said to be in control of the world uh there are just a lot of different entities that have different goals um, and they're coexisting, hopefully cooperating, maybe not cooperating. It depends on the situation. Which, which do you think is more likely to lead to beneficial outcomes with AI? So I think I don't really think about it in these terms. I think about it in like, you know, there are these like kinds of worlds that we could be in. And like some of them are unipolar and some of them are multipolar, but are like very different unipolar worlds and very different multipolar worlds. And so, like, the sorts of questions, it, like, the, the closest an- analogous question is something like, you know, if you condition on unipolar world, what's the probability that it's beneficial uh, uh, or that it's good? If you condition on multipolar world, what's the probability that it's good? And it's just, like, a super complicated question that, like, I wouldn't be able to explain my reasoning for because it would involve me, like, thinking about, like, 20 different worlds and maybe not that many, but like a l- bunch of different worlds in my head, estimating their probabilities, doing like a base rule calc, not a base rule calc, I guess kind of a base rule, ca- base rule calculation, um, and then reporting the result. So I think maybe the question I will answer instead is like the most likely worlds in each, uh, uh, in each of unipolar and multipolar settings, and then like why, how how good those seem to me. So I would say I think by default I expect the world to be multipolar, uh, 
in that it doesn't seem like anyone is you know, particular, I don't think anyone has particularly taken over the world today, any, or any entity, like, not even counting the U.S. as a single entity, it's not like the U.S. has taken over the world. Um, and it does not seem to me like, the, the main way you could imagine uh, getting a unipolar world is, like, if the first the first um, actor to build a powerful enough AI system, that AI system just becomes really, really powerful and takes over the world before anyone can deploy an AI system even close, uh, uh, even close to it. Sorry, that's not the most likely one. That's the one that m people most often talk about. Um, and probably the one that other people think is most likely. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so I... I see the multipolar world as more likely where we just have, you know, a bunch of actors that are all pretty well resourced, that are all developing their own, a own AI systems. They like, then like sell their AI systems or, or like the ability to use their AI systems to other people. Um, and they're just like sort of similar to the human economy where you can just like have AI systems provide labor at a fixed cost. And it just sort of looks similar to the economy today where people who control a lot of resources can like instantiate a bunch of AI systems um, that help them maintain whatever it is they want uh, and we retain, remain in the multipolar world we have today. Um, and that seems decent. I think I like for all that our institutions are not looking great at the current moment. There is still something to be said that, like, you know, nuclear war didn't actually happen, um, which can either update you towards uh, our institutions are like somewhat better than I than we thought, or it can update you to towards if we had nuclear war, we would have all died and not been here to ask the question. I don't think that second one is all that plausible. My understanding is that nuclear war is not that likely to wipe out everyone, um, or even 90% uh, of people. So I'm more, I, I lean towards the first explanation. Overall, my guess is that like, you know, this is the, the thing that has worked for the last, worked. The thing that has like generally led to an increase in prosperity and like, uh, or, or the world has clearly improved on most metrics over time. And like the system we've been using for most of that time is like some sort of multipolar people interact with each other and keep each other in check and like, uh, like cooperate with each other because they have to and so on. Um, and like in the modern world we use like, and, and not just the modern world, we use things like regulations and laws and so on. Uh, to to enforce this and like you know the system's got some history behind it so I, I, I'm like more inclined to trust it uh, so I overall feel okay about uh, this world you know assuming we solve the alignment problem that's we're, we'll, we'll ignore the alignment problem for now uh, for a unipolar world I think Probably, I, I find it more likely that there will just be a lot of returns to um, scale. So like the just you'll get a lot of efficiency from centralizing uh, more and more in the same way that like it's just really nice to have a single standard rather than have 15 different standards. Like it sure would be nice. It, it sure would have been nice if like when I moved to the UK, I could have just used all of my old old um, chargers without having to buy adapters. But no, all the outlets are different, right? Like there's, there's, there's benefits to standardization and um, centralization of power. And it seems to me like there's been more and more of that over time. Maybe, that's not obvious. I look, I'm, 
yeah, I don't know very much history. Um, but if, so, so it seems like you could get even more centralization in the future uh, in order to capture the efficiency benefits. And then you might have a global government that could reasonably be said to be just a unit, like the entity that controls the world. Um, and that would then be a unipolar outcome. Uh, it's not a unipolar outcome in which the, the thing in charge of the world is an AI system, but it is, an, it is a unipolar outcome. And I think I, I feel wary of this, but I don't like having a single point of failure. Um, I don't like it when like there is a, when, when like, I, or like, I really like the, I really like it when people are allowed to like, you know, advocate for their own interests, um, which, you know, isn't necessarily not happening here, right? There, uh -huh. this could be a global democracy. Uh, but, but still, it seems like, you know, it's a very, li it, like the libertarian intuition of like markets are good generally tends to suggest against centralization. And I like do buy that intuition. Uh, but this could also just be a le like status quo bias where I'm like, I know the world, I, I can very easily see the, um, the problems in, in the world that we're not actually in at the moment. Uh, and I don't want it to change. So I don't know. I don't have super strong opinions there. It's very plausible to me that like that world is better because then you can like um, control dangerous technologies much, much better. Like if there just are te technologies that are sufficiently dangerous and destructive that they would destroy, they, they would lead to extinction, then maybe I'm more inclined uh, to favor a unipolar outcome. I would like to ask you about DeepMind and maybe another question before we, we wrap up. Um, so what is it that the, that the safety team at DeepMind is, is up to? No, one thing. Um, the safety team at DeepMind is like reasonably large and there's just a bunch of projects going on. Uh, I've been doing a bunch of inner alignment stuff. Uh, most recently I've been uh, trying to come up with more examples that are, you know, in actual systems rather than hypotheticals. I've also been doing a bunch of conceptual work of just like trying to make our arguments clearer and more conceptually precise. A large smattering of stuff. Um, not all that related to each other, except in as much as it's all about AI alignment. As, as a final question here, Rohan, I'm interested in your, your, your core, uh, your core at, at the center of all of this. So, you know, what's the most important thing to you right now? Like insofar as AI alignment may be the one thing that, most largely impacts the future of life? Ah. Mm. Like if you just look at the universe right now and you're like, these are the most important things. I think for things that I impact uh, at a, you know, more granular, like more granular than just make AI go well. I think for me, it's probably like making better arguments and more convincing arguments. Um, currently, this will probably change in the future, uh, partially because I hope to succeed at this goal and then it won't be as important. Um, but I feel like uh, right now, especially with the like, advent of these like large large neural nets and more people like seeing a path to AGI I think it is much more possible to make arguments that would be convincing to ML researchers as well um, as well as like the you know philosophically oriented people who make up the AI safety community and I think that just feels like the most useful thing I can do at the moment in terms of the world in general, uh, 
I feel like it is something like the attitudes of consequential people towards um, well, long-termism in general, but maybe risks in particular, where, and like, importantly, I, I, I do feel like it is more like I, I care primarily about you know, the people who are actually making decisions that impact the future. Maybe they are taking into account the future. Maybe they're like, it would be nice to care about the future, but the realities of politics mean that I can't do that or else I will be lose my job. But my guess is that they're mostly just not thinking about the future. And like, that seems, if you're talking about the future of life, that seems like the most, that seems pretty important to change. How do you see doing that when um, many of these people don't have the, as Sam Harris put it, the science fiction geek gene is what he, he called it when he was on this podcast. Is like all, you know, the long-termists who are mm -hmm. all like, we're going to build AGI and then create these radically different futures. Um, like many of these people may, may just mostly care about their children and their grandchildren. Like that may be the human tendency. Do we actually advocate for any actions that would not impact their grandchildren? It, it depends on your timelines, right? Fair enough. But like most of the time, the arguments that I see people giving for any preferred policy proposal of theirs, or act just like almost any action whatsoever, it seems to like be a thing that would have a like noticeable effect on people's lives in the next hundred years. So like in that sense, grandchildren should be enough. Okay, so then long termism is, is doesn't matter. Well, I. I mean, I don't... For I, getting the action done. Oh, possibly. Like, um, yeah. I still think they're not thinking about the future. I think it's more of a, like... Like, I don't know. If I had to take my best guess at it with, like, noting the fact that I am just a random person who is not an, at all an expert in these things, because why would I be? And yes, listeners, noting that Lucas has just asked me this question... Uh, because it sounds interesting and not because I am at all qualified to answer it. It seems to me like the more likely explanation is that like there are just always a gazillion things to do. There's always like, you know, $20 bills to be picked off the sidewalk. Uh, but like their value is only $20. They're not like $2 billion. And like, everyone is just constantly being told to pick up all the $20 bills. And as a result, they like are, con uh, they are in a perpetual state of like having to say no to stuff and doing only the stuff that seems like, uh, most urgent and, and like maybe also important. And so like most of our institutions tend to be in a, in a very reactive mindset as a result, not because they don't care but just because that's the thing that they're incentivized to do is to like respond to the urgent stuff. And so getting policymakers to care about the future, whether that even just includes children and grandchildren, not the next 10 billion years would be sufficient in your view. It might be, it's, it seems plausible. I mean, I don't know that that's the approach I would take. I just, I think I'm more just saying like, I'm not sure that you even need to convince them to care about the future. I think, I see. It's possible that, like, what's needed is, like, people who have the space to bother thinking about it. Um, which, like, you know, I get paid to think about the future. If I didn't get paid to think about the future, 
I would not be here on this podcast because I would not be smart. I would not have enough knowledge to, uh, to be worth talking, you talking to. Um, and, you know, I don't, I think there are just not very many people who can be paid to think about the future. And like the vast majority of them are in it. Maybe, I don't know about the vast majority, but a lot of them are in our community and very few of them are in politics and politics generally seems to anti-select for people who can think about the future. And I don't have a solution here, but that is the problem as I see it. And I would want the solution. If I were designing a solution, I would be trying to attack that problem. That would be one of the most important things. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, I think on my view, yes. All right. Um, so as we wrap up here, is there anything else you'd like to add or any parting thoughts for the audience? Yeah. Um, I, I have been giving all these disclaimers during the podcast too, but I'm sure I missed them in some places. But like, I just want to note, Lucas has asked me a lot of questions that are not things I usually think about. And I just gave off the cuff answers. If you ask me them again, like two weeks from now, I think for many of them, I might actually just say something different. So don't take them too seriously and treat like the AI alignment ones. I think you can take those reasonably seriously, but the things that were less about that, you know, take them as like some guy's opinion, man. Some guy's opinion, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly okay uh well uh thank you so much for coming on the podcast rohan is always a a real pleasure to to speak with you you're a bastion of knowledge and wisdom and ai alignment and uh yeah thanks for all the work you do yeah thanks so much for having me again this was this was fun to record <laughs>